Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, where for 35 years we have engaged the public in reflection and dialogue on the key issues of our day from an ethical perspective. All forums are free and open to the public, and information on upcoming events can be found online at westminsterforum.org. You may follow us on Twitter at WestminsterTHF or like us on Facebook at Westminster Town Hall Forum. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church located on Nicollet Mall in beautiful downtown Minneapolis and moderator of the forum. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Jennifer Lawless is a professor of government at American University in Washington, D.C. and the director of the Women and Politics Institute. She describes herself this way. I'm a 40-year-old self-avowed political junkie. Election Day is my Super Bowl. <laughs> the Sunday morning talk shows are my favorite reality TV. And my computer search history shows that politicalwire.com is my most, most visited website. This self-avowed political junkie graduated from Union College in Schenectady, New York. She has a BA in political science. She then earned her MA and PhD in political science from Stanford University. With funding from the National Science Foundation, she has conducted extensive research on electoral politics, focusing on political ambition, representation, and gender in the electoral process. She's a nationally recognized expert on women and politics and the co-author of the book, It Still Takes a Candidate, Why Women Don't Run for Office. Her latest book with co-author Richard Fox is the focus of today's presentation, Running from Office, Why Young Americans Are Turned Off to Politics. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Dr. Jennifer Lawless. Thank you. Cockroaches, head lice, colonoscopies, used car salesmen, traffic jams, root canals, and Donald Trump. <laughs> what do all of these things have in common? They're far more popular than the United States Congress. <laughs> it's true. In head-to-head -head matchups, a national random sample of Americans said that they find the charming things that I just mentioned far more appealing than their representatives in Washington, D.C. Now, the House and Senate might take solace in knowing that they rated a little bit higher than playground bullies, North Korea, and meth labs. But to be perfectly honest, the margins were quite close. <laughs> it's not just cute little polls that find this to be the case, though. The political climate has culminated in the most negative attitudes toward Congress that we've ever seen. The advent of modern polling doesn't even know what to do with these numbers. Not one in five voters trusts the government to do what's right. Congressional approval hovers at around 10 percent, and Senator John McCain even joked that Congress is down to paid staffers and blood relatives approving of the job they do. For decades, pollsters have also found that although people have never been in love with Congress, they at least support their own incumbents. But in 2014, that ironclad reality was turned on its head, too. Last year, 60% of voters said that they supported replacing the entire Congress, including their own incumbent. And roughly half of people said that if we were to replace the entire Congress with random people walking down the street, they would probably do a better job. It's hard to find any evidence of people that think Washington is doing what's right right now. So what are the consequences of a political system that's held in such low regard? What are the implications for democracy when politicians are viewed as so ineffective and our political system so dysfunctional? How does this bode for the future of a democracy? And what does it mean for future generations? Well, in a nutshell, I'm going to argue that Washington's dreadful performance over the past two decades has taken a toll on young Americans who have come to know politics through this spectacle. They see politics and politicians as pointless and unpleasant. They see leaders as corrupt and selfish, and they have no interest in entering the political arena ever. But before I lay out this argument, provide evidence for it, and at least speculate as to how we might be able to change this, 
I feel like I have to cl come clean about something. It's true, I am a political junkie, but it, it's even worse than that. As a two-year-old, I was, according to my parents, quite obsessed with Jimmy Carter. Uh, I loved his name, I was completely enamored by his responsibilities, and I very much worried for his legacy, insofar as any toddler could. By the time Carter left the White House, devastated as I was, my political interest remained intact. I sat mesmerized in front of the television in 1980 when the Iran hostage crisis came to a close and the freed Americans disembarked at Andrews Air Force Base. At age nine, I enthusiastically pulled the lever in the 1984 presidential election when my mother let me go into the voting booth with her. At age 12, I faced a very difficult summer vacation. I had to decide whether to hang out with my friends or watch the Iran-Contra hearings. Uh, I, I, I should admit that I probably spent more time that summer with Oliver North, Fawn Hall, and John Poindexter than anyone else. Uh, by the time I was a junior in high school, I knew my way around a Senate Judiciary Committee hearing like nobody's business. I can still recite several of the questions targeted at Anita Hill. And in January of 1996, when my college roommate came home very upset about a breakup with a boyfriend, I told her that I'd be more than happy to discuss it when Bill Clinton finished delivering the State of the Union address. And so growing up in a very politicized household where it was always impressed upon me that it was vital to stay abreast of current events in government, it was no surprise that I became a political science major. It was no surprise that I got a PhD in political science. And frankly, it was no surprise that I would actually run for office. I might not have envisioned taking on a popular incumbent uh, at a time when I was a professor at Brown and had not yet received tenure, but there was no question that it was something I would ultimately do. And I was proud to do it. I've always thought that government was an effective way to solve problems, that people who run for office actually have good intentions, that a political career is noble, and that there could be little as satisfying than hearing and then heeding a call to public service. So it's from that orientation that both Richard Fox and I wrote this book. And I think that's also why we're both so disheartened by our results. In Running From Office, Why Young Americans Are Turned Off to Politics, we present the results of a national survey we conducted of several thousand 13 to 25 year olds. We asked them about their attitudes toward politics and current events, their career aspirations, and their political ambition. And what did we find? We found that 89% of them, 89% had already unequivocally written off the idea of ever running for office. And frankly, as difficult as it is for me to admit this, it's hard to blame them. The current political system, which is really the only one they've ever known, has turned them off. Consider their first political memory. For some of the older people that we surveyed and interviewed, that was a president lying to them, wagging his finger and saying he did not have sexual relations with that woman, Ms. Lewinsky. For others, it was a president lying to them, this time about weapons of mass destruction. They've experienced a government shutdown. They know only gridlock, inefficiency, and dysfunction in Washington and they see the same sad song played over and over and over again in the 24-hour news cycle. They'd be crazy to want to run for office. So how do we arrive at this conclusion, and perhaps more importantly, what can we do about it? That's what I'd like to spend the next 15 minutes or so talking about. So let me just begin with a very sad state of affairs. I should let you know that I am an incredible pessimist. The glass is always entirely empty, so you should take, <laughs> you should take my remarks from, that, from, from the vein in which I give them. Okay, so in October of 2012, right in the heat of the presidential election, we conducted a national survey of 4,200 high school and college students. So these were young people around the country. We asked them about their political attitudes and aspirations. The following summer, we did hour-long phone interviews with a random sample of 115 of them. And what I'm going to demonstrate to you is that no matter how we ask the question and no matter how we analyze the data, the story is the same. Today's young people have virtually no interest in running for office. So we be began by asking, have you ever thought that someday when you're older, you might be interested in running for office? 89% said, no. 11% said it was something that had at least occurred to them from time to time. We said, okay, even if it's never occurred to you, think about it right now. Would you consider running for office in the future? 93% said, no. We then thought, okay, this is a problem, but it's because these are abstract questions that we're asking. So we presented young people with a couple of scenarios. 
First, we said to them, if the following jobs all paid the same amount of money, which would you most like to be? And they could choose among a business owner, a teacher, a mayor of their town, or a salesperson. Mayor of their town came in a distant third, almost tied with salesperson. We then presented them with another set of options. Again, assuming that these jobs all paid the same amount of money, what would you most like to be? A lawyer, a business executive, a high school principal, which frankly I think is the worst job in the world, or a member of Congress. Member of Congress came in dead last and it wasn't even close. And then we asked them about 20 different jobs, from lawyer to teacher to journalist to doctor to nurse to electrician. We presented them with a list of 20 jobs that included three political positions. And we said, check off any that you might ever be interested in thinking about doing. So this is a very, very low bar. And they could check off as many as they wanted. And out of these 20, mayor, member of Congress, and president of the United States placed 17th, 18th, and 19th on the list. The only thing that was less appealing was an electrician. The next book will be about why young people don't want to be electricians. <laughs> And then in a final attempt to get at young people's attitudes toward running for office, we asked them to tell us in their own words what they thought about it. And let me just read you three quotes. This is from Charlotte, a high school junior from Texas. People in politics, they're squirrely. They say they're going to do something, but they don't do it. I don't want to be part of that. Thornton, a college senior from New York. I'm going into farming. Politics is for people who like to bang their heads against the wall. I'd rather milk cows than run for office. <laughs> and Franklin, a college sophomore from Iowa. By the time you're done with politics, your hair has turned gray. I want to keep my hair not gray. I'd never run for office. <laughs> so it's hard to imagine more consistent evidence of the fact that this generation, high school and college students today, can think of little that is more unappealing than entering the electoral arena as a candidate. Now, identifying this lack of interest in running for office is one thing, understanding its roots is another. And essentially, our argument is that the daily lives of young people don't involve politics. And it's not because they're tuned out. It's, it's worse than that. This is not just some naive lack of exposure to what's going on in the world. It's that they are consciously making an effort not to be engaged because they're so turned off. When they encounter politics, they actually try to minimize their exposure and shy away from it. And this happens in three different ways, or maybe it's better to say for three different reasons. So let me just give you a brief summary of each. The first has to do with family and the way they experience politics in the household. Let me just give you some key facts. Now remember, this survey was taken in the fall of 2012 in the middle of the presidential election. 75% of young people said that their parents never talk about politics at home. 80% said that they have never had a political discussion with their parents at a meal. 50% said they have never had a political discussion with their parents ever. 5% said that they had a parent who ever suggested that they run for office. 2% said that they had two parents who suggested that they run for office. No matter how we look at these questions, it's clear that young people are not getting a message in their homes that running for office is something that they should consider. And several of them made points about why they didn't feel that these conversations took place. David, a college freshman, said, for example, in my family, we don't talk about political stuff. Washington and politicians are miserable. They're terrible and a million miles away. Why should we bother with that? Jane, a high school junior. My parents never wanted to talk about government stuff. They still don't. And when it does come up, they quickly say that the system is too broken to pay attention to. It's not worth our time. Or Elizabeth, a college senior. Oh, we do talk about it. We have big debates at dinner. They start out being debates about important issues but we then just wind up condemning the whole government for being so dysfunctional and ridiculous. So in fact, we then asked these young people, well, what would your parents think if you told them that you wanted to run for office? And their answers were all politically correct. They all said, my parents would want me to do whatever would make me happy. But then they almost all followed up with a sentence along the lines of, but I can't imagine they'd think that would make me happy. Or they'd be shocked. Or I think they'd be sad. They know I can be so much more than that. <laughs> now, these family dynamics matter because family is the most important socializing agent in young people's lives. 
So young people whose parents have encouraged them to run for office are five times more likely to have considered it. Young people who talk with their parents about politics, even just on occasion, are four times more likely than those who never have to consider running for office. And high school and college students whose parents told them that they should actually run are six times more likely to have thought serious about that prospect. And the problem, though, is that these families are few and far between. And why wouldn't they be? Gallup asked a national random sample of adults about the honesty and ethics of people who work in 22 different professions. About 80% of people, for example, thought that nurses had high or very high honesty and ethics. 70% said that they had faith in pharmacists, teachers, doctors, and military officers. Politicians fared a little bit worse. Fewer than 25% of Americans rated local office holders, such as mayors or city councilors, as high on ethics and integrity. That number was cut in half, down to 14% for state legislators. And members of Congress were viewed as honest and ethical by less than 10% of those surveyed. The only people that performed worse than members of Congress were lobbyists. So parents with busy lives, many of whom are struggling to get by, likely see little point in discussing with their families the latest failure in Washington, D.C., or the most recent negative campaign ad that's on the television screen. Although political disengagement by both adults and young people is not a new phenomenon, these recent polls and surveys suggest that now it's far worse than in previous generations. And our analysis makes clear that the tenor of politics is part of the reason and that the consequences are also far-reaching. The second reason, at school with their friends and through the media, young people also shy away from politics. Let me start with those facts again. In high school, among high school students, 65% report that they've never had a conversation with their classmates about anything political. When we asked about 12 areas of discussion young people might have with their friends, school, crushes, dating, sports, food, entertainment, just 17% said that they ever talk about politics. It came in 12th out of 12th on that list. And website use reflects a similar pattern. Social networking, music, shopping, sports, entertainment, all garner far more attention from young people than any kind of political or current events website. And this disengagement, again, is not by mistake. When young people look around and they look at Washington, D.C., they see, and they reported to us, contention and ugliness. And so thoughtful debates over important issues, calm conversations about issues that matter, are alien propositions to them. When they're with their friends, they say that they don't want to argue, they don't want to debate, they don't want to deliberate, so politics is off the table. But they can articulate these thoughts better than I can, so again, let me just read you a couple of quotes. This is Rebecca, a high school sophomore. Most of my friends are big time texters. They don't care about things outside the texting world. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> but that's what younger people do. We just don't care about politics. We focus on other things, you know, the things that matter, places where we can make a difference. Ashley, a college sophomore from Los Angeles. If I bring up anything more specific with my friends than a simple fact like, hey, Obama won the election, my friends are like, I don't follow. And then that makes me want to tell them that this is our country and that they should care. But then they'll think I'm being antagonistic and we'll have a fight, so I don't. Julian summarized this line of thinking best when he said, nope, we never bring up politics. Politics kills the mood. So it's hard to argue with this perception. We live in a time when all national news, almost all national news about politics, is negative and combative in tone. It's almost as though there's no place for thoughtful journalism or positive news coverage. And when media outlets aren't highlighting Washington's inability to get the job done, they're featuring political coverage that often amounts to partisans on both sides of the aisle predictably bashing one another. Fox News regularly treats its audiences to hyperbolic presentations of stories about Barack Obama's failures. And its liberal counterpart, MSNBC, gleefully airs an endless array of stories lambasting the Republican-controlled House of Representatives. And then it's the next day, and we see the exact same thing. And it's not only television that presents politics as ineffective. Late-night comedians reinforce these messages. Um, John Stewart described Congress this way. I'm not saying Congress is bad as it, at its job. I'm just saying that this Congress is equivalent to a skunk with its head in a jar of Skippy peanut butter. 
Uh, when the Republicans held their 33rd vote to repeal the Affordable Care Act, then late night, and now tonight show, Jimmy Fallon said this, it was mostly a symbolic vote that accomplished nothing, or as Congress calls that, a vote. So young people's exposure to politics and current events does tell us that they're not fully aware of what's going on in the world, and that's awful, and it's terrible, but it also demonstrates that they have very little incentive to garner the kind of information that would make them more informed consumers. Again, though, those few young people who do talk about politics with their friends, who do surf the web and find political websites, who do follow news regularly, are on average about six times more likely to say that they might be interested in running for office. And then the third basic reason that young people move away from politics is because of the politicians. In general, yuck is the word that kept coming up over and over and over again. Again, the facts. Six out of seven high school and college students do not think that politicians are at all interested in helping people. Four out of five do not think that they are smart or hardworking. And young people were far more likely to describe politicians as dishonest than honest, corrupt than good-natured, and selfish than selfless. And in the open-ended responses from our surveys and our interviews, this sentiment came out very, very quickly. Some of their perceptions were actually amusingly inaccurate. So one young man, for example, said that he was concerned about the people on Capitol Hill. From what I understand, he told us, most members of Congress have a criminal record. <laughs> Another bemoaned the fact that most members of Congress have been there for more than 50 years. He thinks it's time for some change. But more prevalent than these factually inaccurate statements were general sentiments where young people think of politicians as self-interested liars who are further corrupted by the system. Most politicians are hypocrites, said a college sophomore. They're two-faced. They say one thing to get elected, and then they turn around and do what's best in their own interest. They seem like they're usually out for themselves. Politicians have to lie all the time. That's just what politicians do. Politicians suck. In my opinion, I don't know how to put it exactly. Well, yes, I do. Politicians are just liars. Sometimes it sounds like they're lying all the time. Politicians, it's not good. The people themselves probably started out good at the beginning, but then they had to sell out if they wanted to get anything done. And then they don't seem so good anymore. So today's young people can't imagine entering a system like that and adopting the traits that they perceive as necessary to thrive in it. And many of today's high-profile politicians give them good reason to think this. Now, if we had all day, I could chronicle all of the examples of lying and adultery that I'm completely obsessed with in Congress and on Capitol Hill, and I could provide you with those salacious details. But it's not only scandals and adultery that are the problem here. Consider Representative Steve King. So he's a Republican from Iowa. He dug his heels in over immigration in Congress challenged Democratic Senator, US, U.S. Senator Chuck Schumer to a duel over who really has the xenophobia. Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, uh, frustrated by the millions of dollars that the Koch brothers have poured into elections, resorted to ad hominem attacks on the Senate floor and called the pair as un-American as you can get. Ted Cruz epitomized the unwillingness to compromise by shutting down the government just because he could even though many of his Republican colleagues said they were concerned because they had no plan to reopen the government. So although immigration, campaign finance, and health care are all topics worthy of serious debate and deliberation, thoughtful discussion and progress is often subsumed by provocation and histrionics. It's even reached a point where elected officials on both sides of the aisle are criticized when they behave responsibly. The Charleston County Republican Party, for example, censured U.S. Senator Lindsey Graham for not being Republican enough. He earned this distinction despite receiving a 92 score out of 100 from the American Conservative Union. But what did he expect? He had supported uh, President Obama's Supreme Court nominees. John McCain received a similar censure from the Arizona Republican Party, which condemned his, quote, long and terrible record of voting with liberal Democrats because he voted with them to end the government shutdown. Liberal bloggers berated Democratic congressmen who cooperated with Republicans and mainstream Democrats to reduce the deficit. And the Daily Coast, a popular left-leaning blog, referred to moderate Democrats as a pile of suck. These dynamics leave today's elected officials little incentive for any kind of bipartisan cooperation. 
Now I know, I know, in this day and age, it's very easy to eye roll or yawn or gloss over when we see stories of politicians behaving badly. But it doesn't mean that public policy doesn't suffer when elected officials can't work together. And it doesn't inoculate citizens from developing political attitudes based on this behavior. Unfortunately, what this means is that the small percentage of high school and college students who view contemporary political leaders favorably, that's a tiny fraction, they're the only ones that are interested in running for office themselves. So what can we do about this? I told you, I've painted a bleak picture. But our political system is built on the premise that people will rise up and run for office. We have more than 500,000 elective positions in this country. So if the best and the brightest of future generations can think of nothing more unappealing than heeding the call to public service, that obviously compromises the quality of US democracy. But there is good news. There is a little bit of a silver lining. When we asked young people their goals for the future, almost 80% said that they cared very much about improving the community and improving society. This was right up there with achieving professional success, getting married, and having children. They want to make the world a better place. They just don't see running for office and serving in our political institutions as a way to do that. So how do we change those minds? There are no easy answers. And the two recommendations that I'm going to quickly propose are not magic bullets. But they try to build on our findings that increasing young people's exposure to politics could actually go a long way toward generating interest in running for office. We know that the more you see, the more likely you are to find something that's somewhat appealing. Now it's tricky because that also means that you need to wade through a lot of muck to find an elected official that you think inspires you, to find an example of politicians in a community getting things done. But if you're willing to wade through that muck, you might find a diamond, or whatever appropriate metaphor I should have used there. So let me just conclude today with two of the five reasons we lay out in the book, two of the five recommendations we lay out in the book. And I'm only going to focus on two because you, you have to buy the book to find out about the other three. <laughs> so one, one, what we think pretty easy suggestion is to make political aptitude part of the college admissions process. The primary goal for most 12 to 17 year olds is to attend college. 85% of the high school students we surveyed said that that was their most immediate goal. But it's entirely possible right now to apply to colleges, even the most prestigious ones, and know absolutely nothing about politics or current events. You can't find Iraq on a map? That's OK. We've only been there for a little more than a decade. You don't know the name of the vice president? No big deal. We're going to have a new one soon. You're unfamiliar with which party controls Congress? It's not going to change anytime soon. You'll have plenty of time to learn. You can Google it later. Why not link political aptitude to the college admissions process? It could be in the form of a new entrance exam. It could be an essay. It could even just be a quickie little paragraph that you have to submit when you submit your applications. The mechanism is almost irrelevant. What would be required is letting people know that in order for their application to be taken seriously, they need to be able to articulate, even briefly, some kind of problem, some kind of concern, some kind of issue that they care about. A similar approach actually has been used in the past. When college admissions officers made it clear that they cared about volunteering in the community, high school students' levels of volunteering in the community went through the roof. So if we could get college admissions officers to start valuing political aptitude or political interest among young students, there's a chance that they would acquire the kind of information and they would acquire the increased exposure that might actually allow them to find something appealing in the political process. A second suggestion is something that we call the Go Run app. Whether we like it or not, we live in the era of the app. Right? You can upload photos, request an Uber, find cheap airline tickets, go to a Mexican restaurant, listen to music, do whatever you want to do with the simple touch of an app. And young people do. 81% of people under the age of 25 sleep with their phone next to them in bed. 74% reach for their smartphone as the first thing they do in the morning. And 97% of teens report regularly using phones and smartphones in the bathroom. So there's clearly no activity, no time of day, and no location that is out of bounds for smartphone use, as disgusting as some of those might be. So let's take advantage of this digital world by creating an app that makes it very easy to find out how to run for office, what positions exist, and what those responsibilities are. 
Surprisingly, it's quite difficult right now to find out. I mentioned that there are 500,000 elective offices. There is no clearinghouse or database that houses information about what those offices are, what the requirements to run are, what the responsibilities are, or how you even file to get on the ballot. This app would allow users to enter an address and they would find out every elected position that represents that residence, from presidents of the United States all the way down to dog catcher. Figuring out how to become a candidate would literally be at your fingertips. Educators could clearly incorporate this into their curricula. And young people who are even the least bit curious about how to run for office would not have to engage in a fact-finding mission. They might even find it somewhat amusing to just type in random addresses and find out what the opportunities are. This easy to access information would also showcase that these hundreds of thousands of offices are not at all like what goes on in Washington, D.C. We could chip away at that national lens through which people assess the political system. So at the end of the day, there's no question, our political system has done a number on young people. It's turned them off to the idea of running for office. It's discouraged them from aspiring to be political leaders. And it's alienated them from even thinking about a career in politics. Steering a new course will be difficult, and we have to be creative, but it's the only choice we have. And we will be. But I would be remiss not also to implore politicians to think seriously about the way that they do business. When our elected officials cheer failed policies, shut down the government, accuse their opponents of trying to destroy the country, and refuse to do their jobs, they engage in more than hyperbole. They damage more than the public's short-term trust in government. They undermine, in the long term, the future generation's interest and faith in the system and their aspirations to be part of it. They make it less likely, in other words, that parents will drill politicians' names into their toddlers' heads, that those toddlers will become politically interested teenagers, politically active young adults, and middle-aged political candidates. People always ask me if I'm happy that I lost my election. Do I feel like I dodged a bullet? Why would I want to be in Washington? I can honestly tell you that there is nothing I would rather be than in Washington. Oh, except here with you right now, of course. <laughs> there was no bullet to dodge. I still think that politics is noble. I still think that heeding that call to public service is the best thing that we can do. The goal for the future is to make sure that I'm not the anomaly. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer Lawless. You're listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church on Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister of Westminster Presbyterian Church and moderator of the forum. Our speaker today is Jennifer Lawless, professor of government at American University and author of the book, Running from Office, Why Young Americans Are Turned Off to Politics. While the ushers collect questions from the in-house audience, I want to thank again the co-sponsors of today's forum, Hennepin County Library with funding from the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the online news source, MinPost. Those following on Twitter may tweet questions to us, and we're especially interested in questions from the students from Fridley High School who are here in the audience with us today. I'd like to invite the radio audience to join us at Westminster Church for our next forum on Thursday, November 19 at noon, when foreign policy expert Andrew Basevich will explore the topic, The Indispensable Nation, America, and the Middle East. Our events are free and open to all, and further information can be found at our website, westminsterforum.org. And now, Dr. Lawless, if you would return to the pulpit, I will present the questions from our audience. First question has to do with slicing the data that you've received. Do you see any variation from, say, white students and students of color in, in the material that you've, you've looked up? All of the data that I gave you, obviously, were at the aggregate level, and there was some variation. White students were actually a little bit less likely than African Americans and Latinos to say that they were interested in running for office. Christian evangelicals were a little bit more likely to say that they were interested. And among the college students, women were less likely than men to say that they were interested. And although this variation is important, 
it's still hovering around this general 90% baseline of no interest whatsoever. So it's not like these results are being driven by one small group of people that are particularly turned off. North or south, east or west, high school or college, men or women, cross race, cross ethnicity, across religious affiliation, young people are turned off to politics. Many of us have been watching the debates in the primaries for both Republican and, and Democrat presidential candidates. Do you think those debates are doing much to change the attitude of young people toward politics? <laughs> And can you be specific? <laughs> I think these debates are reinforcing every single word I just talked about. <laughs> Last night after the CNBC debate, CNN put together a reel of the highlights from the debate. And that reel included absolutely nothing about substance, absolutely nothing about success, absolutely nothing about getting things done. It was the most amusing barbs and aha moments from the debate. I will say that it's difficult because in some ways this is what viewers want. We can blame the media and we can blame some of these debate moderators, but the ratings have been through the roof this time around. And when Donald Trump and Ben Carson said that if CNBC didn't accord to their preferences regarding format and length of time, they would pull out, CNBC had to accommodate them because they know that that's where they're getting their ratings from. How do we counter the political ideologues who are proud not to compromise and the willfully ignorant people who vote for them? This was a question from the audience, not me. <laughs> It seems to me that the biggest challenge right now is letting people know that we have a half a million elected offices around the country, and in many of these positions and in many of these political institutions, people are doing their jobs quite well. And they are compromising, they are getting things done, communities do thrive, states are being able to advance. The problem is that we look at really bad behavior in Washington, D.C., we assume that the people engaged in that behavior are representative of all elected officials across the board. And that becomes the lens through which we assess government and politics. And so I think one of the best ways to chip away at the idea that doing nothing is in fact a legitimate method to govern is to highlight some examples at the state and local levels where people do come together. And you know, keep in mind, Several thousand elected positions across the country are completely nonpartisan. Not only when you vote for people do you not know whether they're Democrats or Republicans, but the kinds of issues that they're charged with dealing with don't really have very clear partisan links to them. And so turning young people onto politics by showcasing some of those examples of success might be one way to get around this problem. Who benefits from the turnoff of young people to politics? I don't think anyone does. Um, except, I guess, the, the people that benefit are the stunted student body presidents that are really excited that they're not going to have much electoral competition and they're going to continue to be in office. If we can't inspire the best and the most interested and the most passionate of the next generation to run for office, we're not going to have vacant offices. We're going to have the same old, same old. And as a result, I think, generally speaking, citizens across the country wind up suffering. Have you had the opportunity to present any of your findings and conclusions to actual politicians? Indeed. And if so, what was their reaction? <laughs> it's funny. Um, we presented some of the findings to the Office of Public Engagement at the White House, and they agree that things are terrible. We were on a panel with a couple of members of Congress recently talking about the book, so two newly elected women in Congress, Debbie Dingell, a Democrat, and Elise Stefanik, a Republican. They very much blame the media for all of this. We then were also on a panel that was moderated by CNN's John King. He very much blames the members of Congress for this. And so what we've seen from both the media and elected officials is the general sense that the findings are probably right. And what we're picking up in our surveys and with these interviews is the current state of affairs. Who's to blame is a different question. From our perspective, we're happy to blame both of them and just move on. You've talked about the attitudes of young people toward the political process and toward politicians. Do young people vote? And if so, uh, what moves them to vote and maybe not have good attitudes toward politicians? Do they participate in the process? We know over time young people have always been the least likely to vote. Voter turnout in general is nothing to 
praise ourselves about in this country, and for young people, it's even lower. But that is the one area where we do seem to have seen um, at least sustained levels of engagement. And it was the one area where when we asked young people about any political activity they have experienced in their homes, they did say about a third of them said that they remember going to vote with their parents or their parents voting themselves. So that's the one area where there does still seem to be this civic duty attached to it. But that's where messages of civic engagement and political engagement tend to end. And so whatever is motivating them to vote is not sufficient to motivate them to increase their exposure to politics more broadly. This is from a student in the audience. As a participant in the Minnesota Youth in Government Model Assembly Program, a 1,600 students strong mock Minnesota legislature, what do you have to say to and about students who are actively involved in politics and have even run for mock office already? That's the best thing that you can possibly do. So we know that if you are involved in political extracurricular activities, either in high school or college, you're far more likely to develop the political bug and sustain it through life. What happens is that young people's involvement in things like student government, debate team, mock trial, are low. Those are not the kinds of activities that most people are interested in pursuing as high school students or college students. But when those ingredients are there and when you have that exposure, that's one of the hardest hurdles to clear initially. Once you've done that, it's likely that you're going to continue to seek out political knowledge, political information, and ultimately run. So I would say to all of you that your goal should be to get as many of your friends, as many of your classmates classmates to be involved in those activities too, because those activities are a way to broaden their sense of what politics actually is and what government can actually do. Another question from a student in the audience. You addressed encouragement of interest in politics in the home. What can be done in schools to encourage interest? When I had mentioned that almost no parents regularly sustained encouragement among their children to run, the parent numbers were actually the highest. Teachers, coaches, and other mentors are even less likely to encourage their best and brightest students to run for office, in part because it's not a noble profession. So if you think these kids have the opportunity to really achieve, you're going to think about directing them into places where they might actually achieve. The best thing that we can do is encourage teachers and encourage coaches and mentors to start thinking about politics and to start thinking about electoral office as a path that should at least be on the radar screen in the future. Because if you receive that encouragement to run, it doesn't matter the source. That plants the seed and it's something that you think about later in life. We have several questions coming in uh, through the internet focusing on the costs of running a political campaign. Is that turning off young people? Did, did the decision of Citizens United make a difference to them? You know, I wish it did, because that would suggest that they knew what Citizens United was. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of adults that have previously been politically interested say that the fact that the typical congressional race now costs well over a million dollars or that super PACs have invaded our political process makes them decide they're not going to throw their hat into the ring. The young people that we surveyed and interviewed were not thinking about the nuts and bolts involved in a campaign. They weren't thinking about the rigors of withstanding you know, an 18-month race or taking on an incumbent or anything like that. They just had this knee-jerk, visceral, blech reaction to the idea of being involved in politics. And so it's not like there's any public policy that's keeping them out. It's the general way that business is conducted. Is there a country that the U.S. should look to for effective ways to engage voters, especially young voters? You know, political cultures vary so much. We're never going to be a country that has mandatory voting, right? We're never going to send people fines because they didn't show up and vote on Election Day. But what we can do is try and incentivize political interest. That's why linking it to the college admissions process is one particular way. But as long as we have this very pull yourself up by your bootstraps individualism underlying our political culture, it's difficult to come up with any kind of national move. The other thing that I should note is that young people being turned off to politics, even if it's disheartening, it's totally fine for all of the incumbents that keep getting reelected. So there are also strange incentives here. They don't want to do anything that's going to fundamentally change the system and potentially uh, mitigate their likelihood of success. Historically, young people have been the very involved campaign workers in a political campaign. 
If they're not involved now, who is running these campaigns? So they're involved. They're the 11 percent, right? And so there's, you can all, we're always going to be able to identify and find some anomalies, some people that are really political junkies, some people that rally behind a candidate that are willing to knock on doors. The problem is that that group of people, that tenth of the young people that are out there, are not necessarily representative of the rest of the country. And they're also such a small sliver, it suggests that nine out of 10 people feel sufficiently disengaged that they don't want to play an active role. So it's not about worrying that candidates won't have people knocking on doors for them. It's about broadening and casting a wider net to ensure that people from all different backgrounds feel that they can engage their government. The narrative that emerged around the first Obama campaign is that young people were suddenly newly energized in the political process. Is that true? And what happened to that if it is? So that died. Um, so there didn't seem to be much staying power. And it's not that surprising, right? It's unlikely. That's a very, very high bar to place on one person, right? Barack Obama single-handedly is supposed to change, you know, 25 years of congressional dysfunction and socialized patterns that suggest that young people have no interest in politics. So he was able to energize them around that particular election. But unless there are consistent messages beyond election day that suggest that remaining engaged is vital, useful, and beneficial, they're not going to stay. A number of questions coming forward about where young people tend to get their news these days. This one from a student. As a student, I'm much more willing to get my political information from a comedy show than C-SPAN, thinking of the Colbert Report or the Daily Show. How would you recommend, recommend changing the presentation of information to us to involve us more? Do these shows do damage to young people in terms of the political process? So the shows actually don't do damage. We asked people how often or how regularly do you watch the Daily Show and the Colbert Report. Only about 13% of people said that they watched it even on occasion. So the young people that are watching these shows are not, the, are not typical. But exposure to politics even on those shows makes you more likely to say you're interested in running for office. Because even though they're satire and even though Jon Stewart in particular would criticize and highlight all of the problems, there was also this pretty optimistic under, you know, underpinning, which was that government has the capacity to do better. And with better people in there, there might be success. So, if we could get everybody to watch those shows, I'm, I wouldn't be concerned. It's the same thing people often ask, well, don't you think that shows like House of Cards or Veep are what's turning people off? No, if you can follow House of Cards, you're already very turned on. <laughs> Is it possible the barrage of polls and poll results quoted daily feed into the negative attitude toward politics? Is this a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy? I think so. As long as the conversation is always about who's up and who's down, who's ahead, who gained, who lost, and there's, I should just say as a political scientist, zero attention whatsoever to the margin of error. So you see that things are changing when actually nothing is actually changing. Um, it reinforces the idea that this is just a game and that this has nothing to do with substance. It has nothing to do with solving problems. Again, it's tricky because you, as a candidate, want to raise money. And one of the best things that you can do to motivate donors is to highlight that you're ahead in the polls, because everybody wants to support a winner. And so there are all of these different interdependent actors that have to kind of come together and push for a new kind of politics. And it's very tricky to figure out how to incentivize that. You have run for Congress, or at least in a primary, and said that it was one of the best experiences of your life. We can assume then perhaps you might try again. If you were elected to Congress, what would you do to make a difference? Well, I mean, let's be careful here. I don't know one person. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, look, I think the best thing that, as far as Congress is concerned, it's very difficult right now because there are institutional rules and norms that make it difficult for any one person to change the way things get done. And actually, it makes it quite easy for a small group of people to obstruct and make sure that people don't get anything done. And we can see the recent Speaker of the House elections and the materials and the days leading up to that as evidence of that. But I think one of the most important things to do is to actually do what you want and vote your interests and vote your constituents' interests and to do it in a way where you actually have a general belief in the importance of compromise. And that second piece is the most important thing. 
it's totally fine to run a campaign as an ideologue. It's totally fine to believe all of those things. But at the end of the day, there are 435 members of the House of Representatives. And either everyone can move a little and maybe something can get done, or everybody can dig in their heels and nothing will get done. And I think the goal is to make sure that you get an outcome that's as close to what you want as possible, but that an outcome matters more than no outcome at all. And that seems to be where we've moved away. So I would, I would push for outcomes. How's that for the most vague political statement ever? <laughs> It, it was vague. And now can you specifically say, <laughs> on the last question, what gives you hope about democracy in America? So I've got to believe that this is a swinging pendulum. In the last 20 years, last 25 years, this generation has only seen dysfunction. They've only seen government shutdowns. They've only seen hyperbolic partisanship. But over time, there have been a lot of crises and a lot of periods of dysfunction that we've gotten through and, we, and we've regrouped from. The Civil War, for example, was not a walk in the park. The Civil Rights era, not so great initially, right? But we pull ourselves up and we get through these kinds of things. The problem right now is that, the reason I'm worried is that I'm not convinced that we have the best group of people ready to take on that challenge. And that's why the book is trying to incentivize political aptitude and political interest. Because we can swing the other way as long as we have new voices and fresh ideas to help get us there. We always have, and there's no reason to believe that we, we always won't. Thank you, Jennifer Lawless. Thank you.